Okay. Uh, this is Mike Davis with Lovecraft Ezine. Uh, this is uh, Cthulhu and his minion Blair. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, well, we can watch Cthulhu while I do my opening monologue. He's more, he's more interesting than I am. Um, well, let's see. Tonight is October 26, 2013. Halloween's coming up. Happy Halloween. That's right. <laughs> uh, oh, and uh, speaking of Halloween, oh, okay, so if you're watching for the first time, first of all, I should say we do this every, um, we video chat every weekend. We do it Saturday nights at midnight Eastern, which is right now. Uh, we do it Sundays at 6 o'clock Eastern. Um, you can watch us play Call of Cthulhu every Friday at 9 Eastern, which is... If you haven't played Call of Cthulhu, you might think that sounds boring, but actually it's very interesting to watch us play, right, Blair? <laughs> we have a good time. We have a good time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, speaking of Halloween, um, my son is 11 this year, and just tonight, Danielle and I talked to him about whether he wants to go trick-or-treating, and uh, he he's... Uh, I believe we've reached the point where he's too old to go trick or treating. He feels no, really. <laughs> well, he didn't phrase it that way. He said it doesn't sound like fun. So here's here's our new tradition. Okay. We're gonna go to a cemetery every Halloween now, and tell spooky stories in the dark. <laughs> so, how, how old is your son? Eleven, he said. Yeah. Eleven that's, is that's just a, a, a little early to give up trick or treating, but it's his choice. Oh yeah, if it's not if it's not fun for him, I'm not going to make him do it. So. Well, you know, then you don't get you. You know, I usually have a, like a ten percent dad tax on the candy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't get that much, so maybe my motivation is not. I, I enjoy trick or treating. The thing with, about trick or treating down here, though, to get on my weekly Texas versus Iowa discussion is in Iowa, well first of all it feels like Halloween, which it does this year in Texas, but there's a lot of autumn leaves and everything uh, and you can go, I mean everywhere you go there's people handing out candy. Well here in this little town basically everybody goes on this one long street. It's where everybody goes trick-or-treating. If you try to go trick-or-treating anywhere else in town They'll look at you like you're nuts. Like, what are you doing here? <laughs> trick or treating's over there. Right. It's weird. I mean, now it is fun, but it's just it just seems so odd to just, you know, that's one street. That's where you're gonna go trick or treating, and that's it. Very so, organized. Yes, have some. Yes. When I lived in San Antonio, we lived in Alamo Heights, um, and it was a very very nice neighborhood. Houses were small, they were close together, and so they were kind of packed together, but also it was just well-policed and safe. So a lot of people would come specifically to our neighborhood for trick-or-treating. It's just, there'd be, they'd bring pickup lo truck loads of kids, you know? It's like... <laughs> they shipped them in. <laughs> yeah, they did. It was the same for ours in Iowa, too. It was, it was pretty safe, but... Um... Yeah, well anyway, so now we're gonna we're gonna tell spooky stories in a cemetery, which is a nice new uh tradition to start. So there's a lot of uh haunted houses around um around Dallas, Mike. That that could be good to sort of uh scare the trick or treating into them. Well, we usually go we have been going to this place called Thrillvania, which is in a town called Terrell, about uh yeah. fifteen minutes north of here. And it's like a little small amusement. Halloween small amusement park, I guess. I don't know how to describe it. So we might do that one night next week, too. So, anyway. All right. You guys... Oh, and I'm sorry. Last thing I should say about Halloween is on October the 30th at... Uh, what the hell did I say? Uh, Stay? No. I'm going to do, do a Halloween show. I'm pulling up my calendar with Scott Thomas, um, author Scott Thomas. Okay, here it is, 10 p.m. Eastern time. And Scott did it. Scott and I did it for the first time last year. We decided to make it a tradition. Uh, he loves Halloween. 
and he's written some pretty awesome Halloween type books, quiet horror and all that. So, so tune in on Wednesday, the night before Halloween at ten o'clock, and we'll talk about Halloween stuff. So, so anyway, what do you, you guys got plans? Well, my boys are a little older. Um, they've probably gone trick or treating for the last time. Although there's one neighborhood near where we live now where the older kids went out, like the 13, 14-year-olds, and that was kind of fun. But I think they're just a little too old now, so they may yeah. just get up in costume and uh, pass out candy. Well, that's fun, too. I would love to do that here at the complex, but apartment complex we live in, that would be just as fun for me, but no one shows up. They all go to this one street. It's like if you don't live on that street, you don't have the you don't get the fun part of Halloween of handing out candy. Hmm. These weird Texans, man. I've just alienated all the Texans watching. Well, I don't know. Our neighborhood is kind of under construction. Um, about ten or fifteen houses were just built in the last year. I think there are more young kids now. The first year we were here. Practically nobody came, and we actually took our kids to a different neighborhood. And then last year, there were maybe 10 or 15 who stopped by, and I'm expecting a lot more this year. But, but there's only two other houses. There's only one other house on the street that has any Halloween lights up. Hmm. We got some glowing skulls and a, a bat that flaps its wings. and But nobody else really has any decorations up. And, you know, kids don't see the decorations. They probably don't think it's worth walking around. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a signal that they can go trick or treating. So anyway, getting back to Lovecraft, you guys, what what are you guys reading right now? Anything Lovecraftian? Um, I finished that book by the guy Lehman knows called uh, what was it called? Interland. Oh, Interlands, yeah. yeah. Um, is that a Lovecraftian book? I, that is really a matter of debate. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe not. It there's some things about it that are pretty nice. It it takes place in Providence, but it it's not referring to Lovecraft. Right. Um, and uh, it involves a scholar who's trying to locate an Indian idol, and how she's cross-referencing photographs and using modern archaeological techniques to try and find this. That that's kind of like right up the alley of a Lovecraftian story, but then I found there to be a certain amount of um, the supernatural elements that didn't just work well for me. Furthermore, furthermore, that was too long. The 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 the, the, the length should have been reduced by at least a third. Mm -hmm. I didn't find the characters that compelling, but I mean the story. I I, I was going okay, okay, but it was really kind of. Deus Ex Machina, and there was a lot of, like, not indifferent aliens, but good spirits and evil spirits. If it so, is Lovecraft, and it's more Derlethian, sounds like. I, I, I don't want to... I wouldn't even do that to say it was Derlethian. It was just more like it was just a supernatural horror, kind of. It's not that it's bad. It was... I didn't mind reading it. It's just... I won't be rereading it. Uh, David Riley, uh, Carlo just posted on the message board he's reading The Return. That reminds me that David Riley, who's, who I've published once or twice in the magazine, he wrote a book. He gave me a, a Kindle copy called The Return. It actually, I've only glanced at it so far, but it actually looks very good. So I, I got a copy of that, too. Did you? Uh, it, it looks like it might be good. Then I had several people over the last few weeks uh, when we were talking about movies email me and tell me that I have to, have to, have to watch a movie called Yellow Brick Road, which is on Netflix streaming, and they say it's very, very Lovecraftian. Uh, so I finally found some time to watch it today, and my God, is that a disturbing movie. Wow. That sounds familiar. Does, does Cthulhu invade Oz? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, but you, you would think so <laughs> by the title. 
It's about... Follow the non-Euclidean road. <laughs> <laughs> it's about these guys that... that this hus or husband and wife, a friend of theirs, and some other friends, they decide that they're going to investigate. And, and this isn't to some teen flick. They look like they're in their 30s. Um, they're going to investigate this... Wait, if they're, if they're in their 30s, then they play teenagers on Glee. Yeah, true. Very true. Uh, they're going to investigate this entire town that disappeared in 1940, you know, over 70 years ago. And um, I won't really say anything beyond that. They basically follow the where the people supposedly went because it's it, the town's right next to this huge wilderness in, uh, where was it, Vermont or Maine or something, I don't know. And I, I, I didn't get to finish it. I watched all of it the last 20 minutes, but... Wow. There's one scene in there that my jaw just dropped. I've never seen in a horror movie before. So, But I, I'm still trying to... And i got to finish it, of course. I'm still trying to decide whether it's Lovecraftian. I mean, I mean, everybody... Well, I shouldn't say too much about it. There is a Lovecraftian element. I don't know if I'm going to classify it as Lovecraftian and put it on my movies page or not. But it's, it's if you're a horror fan, yes, you should watch it. <laughs> okay. That's so, a ringing yeah. endorsement. Yeah, well, it's very disturbing, and uh, you know, when I was, I, I, I didn't run out of time. I stopped watching it because I figure I'm going to watch the rest of it tomorrow. So, you know, or, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to go hug my wife now. You know, <laughs> one of those. I'm like, it's a disturbing movie. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Yellow Brick Road. It's. Uh, if you have Netflix streaming, it's free to watch or the low monthly payment to watch. So. There's the there's what it looks like on the. Let me put you on the screen here. There we go. Oh yeah. How the heck yeah. do you do that, man? I'm good. With the obligatory girl being pulled backwards on the. Yeah, the... I, I, a la absentia or any other of those. Uh... Which never ha well, I guess it did happen in Absentia. But. Yeah, it does. <laughs> so a review of Absentia, and they by on on the web the other day by somebody who's obviously not seen it and trying to pretend they have. And one of the lines was, "In the town of Absentia, people are disappearing." What? <laughs> okay. In absentia usually refers to something else, but yes. uh, okay. <laughs> you know, we, we need to get a different cliche than girls being pulled backwards. I mean, that was even in a non-Lovecraftian movie, Taken. Uh, actually, yeah, of... I could think of several movie t posters that are like that. Yeah. Well, the other cliche is if they don't have a girl being pulled backwards, what they do is they have her looking back over her shoulder wearing tight jeans. Yeah. You know, so one or the other. Yeah, it's always a girl in trouble. I had to watch uh, Cabin in the Woods again this week just to sort of get into the the whole meta horror mood there. Uh, <laughs> good did, movie. You, did you read the blackboard this time? Uh, I've already freeze-framed on that, Rick. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> did I miss something in the movie? Well, the, the, if you read the blackboard, it's the hysterical. gambling board is hysterical. And then there's that one entry, Kevin. It has no other explanation except it's something called a killer Kevin, or I don't know. Well, my favorite one is uh, what was it? Uh, molesting trees or something like that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's a good uh, one. movie. You really have to see that a second time to get, you know, when you realize what's going on, to get, you know, like the whole thing was the, the bets over what would be chosen and whatever. <laughs> yeah, there's you parts always, of the movie that are pretty hilarious. There's a lot of little subtle stuff in there that, yeah, you can watch that again and again and pick up. Just And then and then near the end, you try to match up all the monsters running rampant with what's on the blackboard. They had a lot of video game characters in there too because they're big fans of uh, some some of the video games. So that that was kind of cool to freeze frame and uh, 
yeah, I'll watch through all of that. So very cool. Carlo on the message board says uh, there are six titles that have women being pulled backwards <laughs> on Netflix alone. <laughs> <laughs> How did you search for that, Carlo? That's my question. I, I, good question. Wow. Yeah. That's some major searching mojo there. Maybe we should have started a trail where it's the opposite. The woman gets pulled forward by something. <laughs> no, the woman's pulling something backwards. You know, a hand dragging a leg forward, you know, something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, you mentioned that um, Interlands, Matt. Mm -hmm. And do you guys find whether it's Lovecraftian or just horror or anything really? Are there any books that you've read that you don't think maybe the writing's the best or the storyline, let's say, is the best, um, but you really enjoy it because of the setting? Yeah, actually. See, now the thing is. On a lot of the self-published stuff, or the stuff that's published electronically, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any editing help. Right. I think that these people do a read-through, they have a friend read it, they scan it for typos or put it through a spell checker, and they publish it. Right. So a lot of the self-published stuff is like 50% 50, 50 too long. But just for example, I, I really kind of, I'm kind of fascinated by Richard Tierney's world building for Simon of Gitta because he does such a good job with his research. So in his magnum opus, The Drums of Chaos, mm -hmm. the whole concept and setting is just so great that I'm willing to overlook the fact that um, he really doesn't write a good character or good dialogue. What's the setting? Well, it's set at the time of... Um, Basically, it's set at the, uh, like, A.D. 33. It's a crucifixion. And where in 33? In, in the Middle East, in Jerusalem. Uh, okay, okay, okay. And uh, someone is uh, going to uh, basically summon his father, and it's uh, David Bar David, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's kind of like Robert Price in Acute Spiritual Fear. The Father's not God, it's yogg mm. Yeah, that, that actually, Tierney started that in um, The Winds of Tsar when he had uh, this, uh, a story. It was, it was, was uh, the same time traveler who was in that John Taggart. John Taggart. Yeah, it was, it was during Exodus. Right. Well, it's the same thing. Simon Taggart is uh, basically, it's like he presents to try, he's the angel or the devil who presents to try and tempt the Jesus character, mm -hmm. who is really this, young, like a Wilbur Watley character. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, the, he's the one who came out and uh, just said, look at everything you're going to be destroying. Um, so it really kind of knitted together the Simon of Gitta stories and the um, Simon Taggart stories. The whole, the, the whole way that he had presented the the, the characters and the, um, the the way the plot linked up and the way it referred to actual scholarship from the era and uh, the biblical verses, it was just really just breathtaking. Hey, you, are, are there a lot, you guys, are there a lot of, uh, are there a lot of stories where yogg Sothoth is God, basically, and Jesus is a Wilbur Waitley type character? Because I've heard this before, and I don't remember where. This there is two Christ 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 stories. To two of them. One of yeah. them is uh, Acute Spiritual Fear, which is where... Uh, there's a group at Miskatonic University who thinks Wilbur Watley's the second coming <laughs> because he was, he was born of a virgin, you know, and uh, was despised of men. Uh, yeah. And then there's another one, uh, another one very similar that Robert Price wrote where Wilbur Watley wakes up or returns and it's like modern era and it's like 
he's just completely superfluous to the indifference of the modern age. It's Wilbur Waitley waiting. What's that? Wilbur Waitley waiting. Yeah, that was it. Is there anybody besides Bob that does it? Well, Richard Lupoff did something called The Doom That Came to Dunwick, I think was the title, where it was similar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it was kind of almost, you know, like, I, I don't think he actually said that God is Yog Sothos, but it was kind of, you know, saying, you know, it was like Dunwick's being destroyed for killing, you know, Wilbur, and it's like he's, the, you know, it's like there, it's like divine punishment. <laughs> Mark says uh, Matthew looks like he's in some kind of uh, purgatory. purgatory world. I, I, this is my uh, library, except there's only one problem: it doesn't have any lights. <laughs> Perfect for reading. All right. Well, it's, it's, it's like when you get home at night, especially in the winter, and it's dark in here. I can just sit here and pretend I can see my books on the walls. <laughs> So well, that works fine if you got like a Kindle Fire or something you can read in the right. dark. Hey, I, uh, I use my Kindle reader at, at lunchtime on my phone. That's about the only time I use it. Yeah. Just as an FYI, guys, um, I'm just going to do a screen share here. Um, so some a friend of mine just Facebook messaged me, and our chat is on the cover of Google Hangouts right now. So... Uh, <laughs> It is if you're friends with somebody that's in. Oh, there. is that it? Oh, okay. I'm yeah. Like that. Which is, yeah, that's that's neat. But so it's not anybody's cover, no. Unfortunately. All right. Just thought. I it was. <laughs> but you know, one, one thing. A lot of beer. When when we were discussing Richard Tierney, one thing he cleverly did in Drums of Chaos has always been a debate over who who him who is not to be named should be. Durlitz made it has to the unspeakable, but if you read Lovecraft letter, Letters, it's Yog Sotha. And he actually rationalizes that whole debate in that book rather cleverly, if you read it. Well, it, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's a, it's a in, in a way, it's a masterpiece. Yeah. But then I got to say, it's like, I think I said this before, it's like when I first got the book, I had to set it aside for over a year because Bob Christ's introduction aggravated me so much. <laughs> See, he put a major spoiler in there. Oh, you're kidding me. No, and it was like, you can't understand, if you haven't read all of Tierney's works, you can't understand the book. So you got to read Price's introduction because he explains everything. He explains all about Taggart's history and um, the actual what what is the conflict between the great old ones and the elder gods and um, who is Simon of Gita and all this stuff and then he like puts this major spoiler in there it's like it was, I was so aggravated I couldn't read it for a while you know speaking of conflict between um, Pete you know that essay book that I'm gonna that I'm publishing uh, Lovecraftian essays uh, by a lot of the writers. Pete's already sent me his, and it's a very good. He he, he actually made his essay in the form of a, of a story, but that's the point is. He's talked about on the video chats about uh, that all of those gods and everything. They're they're not on the same page with everything, and he does a real good job with that in his in his in his essay. So that's going to make a nice addition to that book. So, what what are you going to talk about, Rick? Have you decided yet? Oh, I was going to do in, interlocking myth patterns. Oh, right. Like what? Like uh, you know how Robert E. Howard had his really own little separate thing going, which crossed you know like Hyboria is really not part of the Cthulhu mythos, but it crosses over. Right. And Clark Ashton Smith was really doing the same. It really is until you get Henry Kuttner and Robert Block and Durlitz where you get people who are, who are writing really mythos stories, even though they might not call it that at this stage. I don't know. Do you, do you really think you have the expertise for that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I, I'm kidding. It, it, no, it, it helps when you were reading Ark. You know, I, I got into getting the Arkham House editions in the 70s. Yeah. 
And as I said before many times, particularly when Joe was on, in those days, you didn't have S.T. Joshi with these wonderful annotations. Right. And you didn't have Cthulhu encyclopedias or even called Cthulhu source books. Or even that internet thing. Yeah, so you had to read these things over and over again. And I remember when it finally dawned on me after I was rereading some of them, going, Durlitz made up the Elder Gods. Lovecraft can't decide what the Great Old Ones is, or keeps changing his mind. Is what yeah. Mean. I really, we really, I mean that that all got expanded upon with some good essays by Robert M. Price, but you know the old ones was always something different. You know, in the mound, it's a group of humans, in fact. Something so, you guys said a minute ago made me think of. Someone sent me a question the other day that I don't have a good answer for. You guys probably have a better answer than I would. He basically asked about. Um, Lovecraftian horror before Lovecraft, and of course there is some. I could name a couple, but what what's you guys' thoughts on that? What should we well, say, cosmic horror, maybe? I. What about the White People by Matchin? Right. And the and the King in Yellow. Yeah, that would be Chambers. And uh, I think the White People is just brilliant. It, it really, everyone should read that story. And, and why they're not well written, Edward Board Lytton in things like Zanzoni was playing around with dwellers at the threshold or whatever. But those are those are badly executed books. Well, what would you think about the House on the Borderlands? That's good. Yeah, well, I would say so. I thought the Nightland went a little out of control, but House on the Borderlands works well. You know, it's kind of interesting. That um, it's almost you can divide fantasy into the pre and post Tolkien eras, and a lot of the fantasy post Tolkien is all fundamentally a knockoff or heroic or yeah. Um, and and what came before was really quite diverse and um, a lot stranger. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm even thinking of like uh, the Titus Grown series by Mervyn Peak. There's elements of that that are sort of uh, Lovecraftian's, well, very gothic, don't you think? Yeah. I haven't read those, but it's about a guy alone in this castle, so it's. Gormangast, is it? Uh, the thing is, I think there were three books, Titus Grown, Gormenghast, Titus Alone, and what I heard from reading Lynn Carter was Mervyn Peake died of a brain tumor while he was trying to finish Titus Alone, so Titus Alone was really rushed, and it wasn't quite as good as the others. Um, but it was a uh, very grim and forbidding series. I don't know why I read it. And did you read A Voyage to Arcturus? Uh, I've I've heard of that. David, is that David Lindsay? Yeah. It, it, my my point is is like these were all these older fantasy and science fiction or science fictiony fantasy stories, more along the lines of Clark Ashton Smith. Yeah. You know, being very bizarre and very alien. Pre Tolkien. If someone wants to look into that sort of thing, what I would say is. Looking into the Ballantine fantasy series might give you a flavor for the way authors were going. And I, I just remember what I was going to say about on the Lovecraftian book uh, before Lovecraft was uh, the Great God Pan. So. Mm hmm. The Willows. And just to show you a very weird example of pre-Lovecraftian cosmic horror, there was a French novel called Bal, hmm. written by René Dunay. I think I just want to get the date right. It's 24, so it predates Call of Cthulhu. Black Coat Press put it out. And it's lesbian cosmic horror. Okay. Sounds great. Yeah. 
It's got how, this. How can you go wrong? Weird tentacle entity that comes in at seances and rapes people. It's erotic Lovecraftian horror before Lovecraft. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> hey, did, did you see that woodcut, The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife? That's from like 1820. You know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. The... A woman having sex with an octopus. Was that from Japan? Yeah. yeah it's Japanese woodcut. Yeah. It would have to be, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, oh, the other thing I was going to say was uh, the Horla. Garu Masapant. I'm saying his name right? Yes. Which some people think the Horla was uh, Lovecraft got the idea for Cthulhu. I, I personally don't see it. I can see that more influencing Dunwick Horror because it's kind of invisible. Yeah. Uh, and I, I didn't care for the invisibility part of it, but what I what I liked was the it, the cosmic horror and the fact that you know okay mankind's done with because the horror is going to take over with take over. Um, which always makes me think of the old debate we had one time here about a year ago, friendly debate about what do do the do Lovecraftian gods are we are we ants to them or are we cattle to them? You know, to the Horla we were cattle, but to a lot of Lovecraftian gods we're ants. They they, they barely notice us at all, if at all. So. Which is probably a, bit, a debate, it's something we ought to talk about. I, I notice you, Mike. I notice you every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, Cthulhu is noticing people because he's sending dreams out to everybody. Yeah, or is yeah. that just part of his ability or just his the degree of evil that he has? I mean, is he conscious of it or is it just... Yeah, good question. You know? Because it's like you come in contact with Cthulhu and then he's... You know, just from there on in, it's like you've opened the door and then you can't close it anymore. I, I it's not like he's he's you know <laughs> going over the sculpture, going now you're going to think of this. It's like it's the degree of his connection is just so bad that it messes you up. But it's still Lovecraftian, whether we're um, whether we're ants to the Lovecraftian God or were cattle to the Lovecraftian God, wouldn't you say? It depends on the story, it depends on the on the God, too. Uh, Tierney goes into that some in his mythos. <laughs> uh -huh. um, there's the one group which, um, and th he, this brings up, comes up in the House of the Toad and some of his other works as well as the Drums of Chaos. That one group, I don't, I think they're the uh, the ancient ones or something like that, I, I don't remember which group, that mm -hmm. they feast on psychic distress. That's the elder the, gods. The elder gods. So what they want to do is promote a large human population to grow, and it's not just humans, it's other aliens on other worlds, and then they send waves of misery and pain and cause the great dying, and it gives you the, like this smorgasbord of psychic misery. Oh, yes, I seem to recall reading a story that had that in there. Um, and then right their here. opponents yes. want to destroy humanity, not to spare them this, but to deprive their enemy of a food source. Yeah. Hmm. So wow. It, yeah. You're screwed with either one of them. Yeah, exactly. Well, 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 what Tierney did was he made the elder gods evil. Is that like they're preserving the status quo so they could feed on everybody, rather than being benign beings in a lonely sense? Durlitz always said they were indifferent, but he never really gave you that impression. Unlike, let's say, Wilson and uh, was his ally in Repairman Jack. You got, you definitely got the impression these guys don't care for us. They just want to beat the other guys. Yeah, there's a book called, I think it's called Cthulhu's Reign. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it. Mass Market Paperback. I think Daryl Schweitzer edited it. Yeah. I haven't read it in a few years, but I do remember that there was a couple of stories in there that impressed me, although I remember almost nothing of the book now. Uh, but there was this, this one scene in one of the... Oh, I'm sorry. It dealt, for those that don't know, it dealt with 
it, it wasn't. It, it dealt with what happens after Cthulhu or whatever Lovecraftian deity takes over the earth or does whatever after the world ends. And there was this one scene where this guy comes to this group of people and he asks what they're doing, and they're, they they said, "Well, we're in line for the food." He's like, "You're in line to get food," and they said, "No, we are the food." You know, so. How to uh, serve man. Yeah. <laughs> Which I bring that up because of this cattle versus ants, you know, thing. Um, there was a really good story. Um, it might have been The Recruit. It was in a Delta Green anthology. Which is, there's this, it's up in Ithaca country, there's this uh, creature that is invisible, going through the air, and it's just murdering people horribly in this bitter cold climate. Mm -hmm. And the upshot gets to be that it doesn't understand anything about what it's doing, but it kind of, it doesn't understand any sort of concept such as death. But there's an interesting psychiatric or psychic ripple when someone dies, and it likes that, so it keeps trying to reproduce that ripple. Hmm. And so it's going around, you know, basically ending people's lives terribly for just this sensation. It's on drugs, basically. But yeah, but it's not in any kind of sense. It do, it doesn't fathom human life or uh, what death might mean. That's a combination. So what you're, you're saying is that's a combination of the ant and the cattle. It doesn't even notice humans, but it's yet it's feeding off of them. I don't even know feeding. It's just kind of like oh, kind of pretty, you know, or look at that color. It's like you know what I mean. It yeah, doesn't really have to do it. Delta Green, huh? You know, I have not. Should I should I try some Delta Green books? I'm not. Yes, really yes, yes. Especially um, when it first came out. There, there's like four or five books in the series. There's John Tynes wrote a novel, The Rules of Engagement. It's got one major problem that there's this FBI agent named Matt Carpenter who gets shot. But um, <laughs> otherwise, it's a really good novel. Mm. And then there were a couple uh, anthologies. There was Alien Intelligence and Dark Theaters, and I thought they were both fabulous. Mm. Now the thing is. Denied to the Enemy was a later novel, which I didn't care for as well. Then John Tynes accumulated all of his stories and put them out in another book, so it was mostly reprints. And there's just been a recent Delta Green Kickstarter campaign that put together another novel. Um, I'm, the, the name is, I'm blanking on the name right now. But if you pick up the Rules of Engagement, it is Considering how bad most mythos novels are, this is really quite good. Uh, somebody's, I've not read this yet. Somebody sent it to me. I've, this is the one I've got. Yeah, that's the one that got, came off the Kickstarter campaign. Oh, okay. I don't even remember who sent this What's to me. What's the title of that? Uh, Through a Glass Darkly. You know, Mike, I might have sent that to you. Yeah, I was thinking maybe you did. It, is it good? Um, it's one of the ones that's on my... My reading time just got shot to shit recently. Yeah. Um, it's on my stack. You act like you have a job or something. <laughs> well, I, one of my partners retired, and uh, about the same time he retired, we suddenly got very busy. And oh, I'm having to make, like, uh, frequently making a drive to Galesburg, which is a city like 45 minutes from here. And so if I want to spend any time with my kids, it's like, yeah, well, you know, give up the reading. That's a nice looking book. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, the secret history it reveals is frighteningly plausible. Okay. And like Lovecraft's fiction nags at you and makes you doubt its fictional qualities. Yeah, I, I yeah start, if, if you can get a copy, The Rules of Engagement is a great place to start. Or okay. Dark Theaters, the anthology. I okay. mean, there's a, there's a, it, maybe it's in Alien Intelligence or Dark Theaters. There's a book, a story called Russian Dolls, yeah. about a group of uh, enthusiasts who go to Yugov. 
Uh, they're taken by an alien spacecraft to Yugoth, and it is it's just, I think it's by Robert Fury. It is really well written. Okay, I, li I lied. I have two of them. Um, maybe you sent me this one, too. Uh, Dark Theater? Dark Theater? Dark the start there. That's okay. a great book. All right. I'll do that. You know, a part of me rebels against this uh, concept of there's a you know, group fighting the Lovecraftian stuff, and part of me really loves the idea. Well, know? it's a little it, it, it's a little like David Kanye's Harrison Peel. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, you know, if, it's written, if it's written right, I know I would like it. So. Also, also, Delta Green also has this thing, is that it, it's it's been disowned. They're like fighting the... The great old ones, but they're not sanctioned by the government anymore. Okay. So that makes it a little, you know, more interesting. Than not, you know, it's ha having the government agency fighting the mythos can get a little out of hand. It's so really do it well that, that way. Yeah. Uh, oh, let me throw in the. Uh, you get anybody? All you guys watching? You want to buy these books? Uh, it. Do me a, a big favor and go to the website and buy them through my Amazon portal. Help support the magazine. There's a I, I got a link at the bottom left banner. It's probably the easiest way to do it. it. Won't cost you anything extra, but yeah, this does look good, Matt. Didn't they do a movie too? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't, I don't, I don't think, think so. Am I thinking of somebody else? It was, it was a group like that, though. It was it was kind of horrible. <laughs> yeah. You, you mean you mean a government group battling Cthulhu to all intents and purposes? Yeah. Fringe, essentially. It was. Uh, it was. I think it was this one. Oh, oh yeah. That's, that's not Delta Green. It's that Delta Green. You know, that was the pilot for a British show. Well, it's hard to tell. I mean, it was like the first episode of a obviously. Oh, it says Delta Green on it. That's what threw me. It says Delta Green on the back. Or, yeah. And they put, me, put it on the screen here. Could you flip that around again? Because I think we showed us the wrong one. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the British one. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's a little... Rough little, magic. Yeah. Built a green thing there. Oh, no, okay. This is exactly what I would want if a TV show was based on the Delta Green universe, a public, uh, perfect blend of trade, <laughs> trade craft and love craft. Scott Glancy quote. Well, you see, it's like it, it was sort of like watching part one of a Doctor Who serial from the 70s. Yeah. Meaning, like, you can't judge just by part one whether it's going to be good. You know, some of those, you know, grab you right away, and then some it really doesn't take off till part two or three. So you were getting the setup. Well, I'll tell you what, in this H.P. Lovecraft collection, this uh, Out of Mind sure was awesome. You know, you guys remember that one? Canadian, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. It's actually available on YouTube, um, out of mind. But it's the one where uh, Lovecraft, I don't know, it's this weird thing where the guy goes back in time, or in, a, in one of Lovecraft's dreams, and the guy's wearing a Lovecraft t-shirt and talks to Lovecraft. Yeah, it that was totally really nice. stupid, but it actually worked out pretty well. Well, because they do a lot of the sort of the little the stories, some of the little stories, like um, Statement of Randolph Carter, and um, just they throw in some of the stories in there just to sort of give you a taste of it. And uh, But yeah, I remember when that aired on uh, Bravo TV, that was, uh, yeah, it was a Toronto group that put that together. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I'll, I'll read that Delta, Delta Green book then, Matt. Yeah, there, there's. Um, I was sort of meaning to compile a list of like that because this relates a little bit to Cody Goodfellow's um, Radiant Dawn and Ravenous Dusk, and it relates in some ways to Charlie Strauss's Laundry series, the idea of these government agencies or organized agencies 
aware of what the general public is not and striving to do something about it. Yeah. And um, Peter Worthy had a series of stories like that that I didn't care for as much. Same same idea, but um, I, I found that the Delta Green, the Cody Goodfellow, uh, the Harrison Peel stuff, that's really quite appealing. It's really uh, most of those authors who have been dabbling in it are pretty darn good. Yeah, I like I like all of those that you just mentioned, um, Harrison Peel, Cody, and um, uh, well, I should say I'll probably like Delta Green, but I, I tried to read the Charlie Strauss stuff a couple of times, and it, it, it's I know it's probably just it's a personal thing because a lot of people like it, but I just can't get into it. Did Did you read a Colder War? I think that's one of them that I tried, yeah. So I mean, it's been several years. Maybe I should try again. Who knows? Well, um, I, I think if you're going to do... You know, I haven't read all of them. I just read really mainly Delta Green and, and Harrison Peel. If you're going to do a Lovecraftian spy novel, you got to write it for, in, in the John Le Carre mode rather than the Ian Fleming mode. You can't have these guys, you know, you know, Doing great, battling Cthulhu, you know, as well. Yeah. They gotta be being betrayed by their own people while they're doing this. So then, so then, so then, you know, the whole concept of being depressed about the universe is being being depressed about the the treachery of the treachery of the government situation, <laughs> the backstabbing, and everything. Well, uh, let's face it. If we were gonna have the best scenario of government agents versus Cthulhu, it would have to be the X Files. Come on, Chris Carter, that can be your next movie. Bring in the ranks, bring in those ratings. See, I actually think that that's where, like, A Colder War was just brilliant. Um, I'll have to give it another try. Anyway. But I think that, that genre has been, uh, been explored, and uh, most of us been pretty darn good. I was uh, actually going to be trying to compile a list of those books. Yeah, send that to me. I'll publish that. I'm waiting to publish the erotica list that you sent me until I get closer to doing that. I might have to update it. There's a couple other things coming out from. Um, there's a small press that's putting out some more quote Lovecraftian unquote erotica stuff, and um, I'm still looking for comics. There's just no way. It's just uh, I don't see how anyone could possibly be a completist on this. <laughs> I, you know, well, you know me. I mean, you're more of a completist than me. I would rather have a list of, okay, here's the here's the really good ones. Because you give somebody a list of a hundred, and they're like, geez, where the hell do I start? I want to say, okay, if you want to read a Lovecraftian comic, here's where you need to start, and then branch off from here. You start with the Courtyard uh, by Alan Moore. But see, yeah. there, it's like, okay, there's. I think of there's there's like. Maybe four groups of Lovecraftian comics. There's those that are straight up adaptations of his stories. Right. There are those that feature him as a character. There are those that are mostly funny. And then there are those that are actual Lovecraftian storytelling using the medium of comics. Right, like that one I introduced you to. Uh, right. What was that? I forget. Uh, oh, Fatal. Fatal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So the, the, you could you could group it several different ways because you know, but it, you start with Alan Moore. Now the other thing, did you read Neonomicon? Yeah, I have that. I read that. I had some heartburn with that. Well, yeah. I mean, two. I had two major sources of heartburn with that book. Um, the first was. It, it, more minor was that it turns out, oh, it's another case of Lovecraft was telling the truth. And uh, it was like, and when you do that, it, it, to me, it just blows the world building to hell and back. Yeah. I really don't like it when people use that as a plot device. But the other thing was, this is, I don't mean to like step on toes or I don't, I don't even know how to phrase this right. I'm not. It struck me that a lot of the depictions of the rapes were done in a fashion to be titillating. 
Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And, and I think that was just wholly inappropriate. And I put that on the, the, the I, put, I lay that at the feet of the author. Well, and I just it, thought it was really it, wrong. Uh, yeah, it's misogynistic, is what it is. Yeah. What, Rick? Yeah, I was going to say, just as an overall comment, when I see a rape scene in a movie or in a comic or whatever, if you're going to do that, do it with a fade out. You don't have to, you know, I, I have this problem with uh, you know, Sergio Leone, just to, to get into something totally off off the side. The way he handles rape in Once Upon a Time in America, and they did it in one of his westerns, too. I just saw it. Or, Rick, you have to make it where you're absolutely horrified watching it, and you, you're left with this, how on earth could anyone do this to another human being feeling? You know, if you're not, I've, seen, I've seen two movies where I thought they did it right. Yeah, very few. One was Rob Roy. I haven't seen that. Yeah, one. okay. okay. They had a really vile rape scene. Um, and Jessica Lang was Jessica the woman. Jessica Lang, yeah. Um, and uh, I'm not remembering the name of the guy who was the actor. He was really, it was, it was very, I thought, appropriately done. And the other was an Ingemar Bergman movie called The Virgin Spring. Um, but, mo but it's like I was really disturbed by Neonomicon for that reason to the point where I was like, I, I don't recommend people to read it. Yeah. Yeah, you almost feel dirty after you're done reading that book. Um, I highly Which recommend it. It's too bad because I really thought The Courtyard was brilliant. Well, and I don't have high hopes then. I've not read. I've not read the courtyard yet. I've got to save up some money and read it because Alan Moore is not, believe me, not on the list of people that think he needs to get Mike Davis's opinion on his books. So he doesn't send me free copies. <laughs> Wasn't that? <laughs> a, yeah, sorry, do you, you want a long... graphic novel for the Neonomicon? What's that? You have the hardcover graphic novel Neonomicon. I the graphic novel. It's not hardcover. Well, check because in the hardcover one, the, it includes the courtyard. Uh, it's I, a prequel. Sure not, but I'll check. Yeah. Isn't there also a short story version of that? Um, oh, here, here's what I understand: is that um, Moore was writing a Lovecraftian story or a novel. And he left it in a taxi, his only copy, and he never could recreate it. So then instead he wrote The Courtyard. It's something along, I'm, I'm getting this wrong, but it was something along those lines. I, I seem so to remember reading his Lovecraftian story never got written. But then I saw an announcement that he is now doing another, quote, Lovecraftian comic, which I'm... And, and, and it's like, you know how pompous he can get. He's writing... No shit. It's going to be the... He said it's the most heavily researched Lovecraftian comic of all. Who cares? It's got to be a good story. Well, there you go. Right. Um, well, if we're... Since we are talking about Lovecraftian comics right now, uh, I will say that... Uh, now, I'm not talking... I agree with your four classifications strongly, Matt. Um, if we're talking about... Lovecraftian themes for everybody out there watching. Fate, you you really should pick up Fatal. So, um, I just think that's excellent. Good good characters, good storyline. So. You you also get some superhero comics where it's you know them against the mythos. Or, uh, there were a lot of Conan comics which had that. He visited at the he visited at the Mounts of Madness. He fought Chub Nagurath in one uh, savage sort of Conan that was recently re reprinted. Well, you know what I'm going to say next. We can't talk about Lovecraftian comics and then you mention superheroes without me mentioning uh, the doom that came to Gotham. <laughs> yeah. Three three part uh, Elseworlds Batman versus the Mythos. That's very, very good. And it does get a little Durlethian, I will admit, but I mean... I still liked it. Yeah, how can you go wrong? It's just a great story. And it's Batman, come on, you know? So. 
probably well, better handled in Doctor Strange versus the Mythos. What'd you say? It's probably better handled than they, they they had a plot line where it was essentially Doctor Strange versus the Mythos. Was it good or no? No, it, well what they what they did was they didn't have like the rights to Lovecraft then or so they took everything from Robert E. Howard that was sort of Lovecraft. So, like, instead of the deep ones, we'll use the Serpent Man of Alusia. Um, that could still work, though. It doesn't have to be the exact gods or anything if it's a good story. Yeah, but it, but it gets a little too, you know, I mean, you know, Doctor Strange ends up saving the world from uh, Cthulhu was Shumagoroth to all intents and purposes. Right. Or he was Yog soth Shumagoroth was only, like, mentioned in one Robert E. Howard story, Curse of the Golden Skull. They just took that name and just created a uh, a god who was part Cthulhu, part Yog Sothoth around him. Well, everybody looking up the Doom that came to Gotham right now is probably going, "Holy crap, that's expensive!" I think it's like twenty bucks a comic, and that's true. But I've had mine a while. They they go up. They're going up in value because there's no reprints. So you won't lose money on them. They're an investment. <laughs> Well, we need this great Lovecraftian movie, and then they'll come out again, and you know. Yeah. Sean Stiff is asking: Are there any current Mythos Lovecraftian comics coming out in the next little bit that you guys are aware yeah. of? Oh, there's 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 lots. Um, uh, Witch Doctor. Okay. Um, basically, there are these ancient beings, the Archeons. And there are these, quote, parasites or hangers-on. You, you could think of them as the parasites on Cthulhu's butt or something. Who, who worship Cthulhu. And there, folks, is the line of the evening. That's right. The, the, they basically, they worship these archeons, and they, they cause torment to humanity. So there's this witch doctor who specializes in removing these infestations. His name is Vincent Morrow. Uh, and he may well be Herbert West going under a pseudonym. We'll ask Pete that question next time Pete's yeah. on. This is really top drawer fun. It's funny, it's well drawn, it's cleverly plotted, it's got good characters, crackling dialogue. Nothing not to like about it. Huh. And of Which, course... Um, Witch Doctor. Did you ever read Fall of Cthulhu from Boom Studios? Uh, uh, it sounds familiar. Yeah. Okay, well, did I send you my list of comics, Mike, or something? Yeah, you did. I I just haven't had time to post it yet. Yeah. I, I started to read that, and I couldn't get into it. Well, the first, it's divided into six graphic novels, each comprised of three or four comics. And it's basically, Nyar Lathotep is trying to do something that will summon Cthulhu. And the first three sets of graphic novels are really, I thought, top drawer. And it fell down a little bit on the latter part of it. Still well worth a read. And then Mike mentioned Fatal. I think that's great. It's great stuff. Well, I just wrote myself a note to this week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to post that list of, that you sent me. So... Well, we got everybody interested in these low crafting comics. So, guys, watch the website Monday or Tuesday. I'll have that published. I promise. Cool. So, it's a good list. It, it really is. So, yeah, Fatal looked great. So, oh, I I, I know it was. I asked the question a long time ago now about settings. Uh, you know, the reason why I ask is because I used to like Dean Koontz quite a bit. Um, and then he's just really gone off the deep end, I think. He gets real preachy, and he's got these weird uh, conservative views and tries to have his characters talk about how evolution is stupid and, you know, not you know all this crap. So I don't read him hardly at all anymore. Uh, but his his brother Odd series, I read the first one. I thought, it, or sorry, his Odd Thomas series. I read the first one, thought it was pretty good. Uh, these are horror, not Lovecraftian. Uh, second one was a piece of crap, and then the third one, 
it is called Brother Odd, and it's not that great of a storyline. It's not like a lot happens, but I really, really like the setting of the book. Uh, Odd Thomas has gone to this monastery on this mountain, and it's just like this really peaceful setting. It's snowing. Uh, then some weird things start to happen, but it's it's like I, I basically like the book because of the setting, not because the storyline's all that awesome. So, and there's some weird characters in the book too, which make it kind of interesting. So, I'm sure everybody has these books that they like that the storyline's not so great, but maybe you like the setting, or at least you said you did, Matt. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, Fred Chappell's Dagon is like that because essentially it's the, the rats in the wall, August Durlitz plot of a guy inheriting a house or moving into a house and finding something like the mythos there. Mm -hmm. But it's done very well. You know, I hate that novel <laughs> with, a, with a visceral passion. This is because it was there were th there's the the concept was so cool and the characters were so unlikable and tedious. It's like the prose was beautifully crafted and it was a horrible slog to read. I think I tried reading it because I do have it and I couldn't get into it. I don't recommend you this. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, we're either going to like it or hate it. Apparently. <laughs> but, I mean, but we, you, you've had other people come on and have praised that. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah so it's... I mean, uh, some, some stuff, I mean, a lot of stuff does come down to uh, personal preference. Oh. And you you know if you're talking about the concepts good but the characters are you know we're like that used to be the knock against Lovecraft. I mean if you look at Call of Cthulhu, do you really care about Johansson and uh, the narrator and uh, no. Professor Angel, no. Inspector Legrasse? No, but the narrative is sweeping you along. That is, yeah. I mean if you had to, I mean Call of Cthulhu is. Someone had never lo read Lovecraft, and you want to give them one story to get across to them the concept of the mythos and cosmic horror. You know, that's the story to hand them, I think, in my opinion. If you had to just pick one, which is an interesting question. Do you guys agree with me, or would you hand that person a different Lovecraft story? Go with that. Yeah. Matt, what do you think? Um, I think it's hard because uh, the the culture has just changed so much from when I was young, with so many distractions and uh, short attention span theater basically, and uh, people, you know. The editing of even the editing of movies and music videos has changed such that it's all very choppy and short, and it's mm -hmm. all kind of like in opposition to Lovecraft's writing, which you have to be willing to invest some time into it to get into it. So, like, I remember just being absolutely blown away when I first read a call, the Call of Cthulhu, when I was like, well, I don't, fourteen, thirteen. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if my sons really can't tolerate it. They like the idea of it, but actually reading the story is difficult for them. Yeah, in good points, but assuming assuming someone laying that aside, I mean, is that the best Lovecraft story to illustrate cosmic horror or would it be No, that would be that would be the um, color out of space. Yeah. Color out of space, really? And you don't need to. That's a good choice. You don't need a huge background for it. I mean, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't. You, see, the problem was that the Madness of Madness. To really appreciate that, you had to have read Call of Cthulhu and Whisper in the Darkness because it ties into those. Colorado Space is sort of the standalone story. 
Shadow, Shadow over Innsmouth, if, if you're talking about small attention spans, Matt, I mean, that's something that I would show someone, because it really reads like an action novel. For, for that, running through the Gilman Hotel and staying ahead of the crowd and stuff like that, that's, that's pretty intense for Lovecraft's writing. But it doesn't really tie into these cosmic themes that I think what Mike is talking about. And I don't know, if, if you're sort of trying to elucidate that man's place in the cosmos, that they have no place, there's a couple of great lines from Call of Cthulhu that directly address that. No better than I think any of the other stories that I can think of. Yeah. Just, I mean, I, I my favorite story is probably Shadow Out of Time, but I w if someone said, you know, give me just one to illustrate the, you know, the main Lovecraft themes, I wouldn't hand them Shadow Out of Time. You know, I'd hand them Call of Cthulhu. I can't argue with the choice. It's really, it's, you know, but on the other hand, it's like, I'm hardly objective about it, you know. <laughs> I think uh, there's different one novels for different people. I think it really depends on the kind of person that you are, because there, certain different things are going to appeal to that person, and then I would, you know, I'd get to know them, and then I'd give them, you know, Cthulhu or Shadows or, or you know, maybe even the Dunwich Horror is another good one that might work in some regards. Well, that's uh, a good point. And you know, if, let's say they're a sci-fi, they like to read a lot of science fiction. You'd hand them Mountains of Madness. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Or if they're a fantasy Tolkien type person, Dream Quest of Unknown Kadath could work. Yeah. I don't know if I ever give that as one, well, that, one story. That, Here you go. That, <laughs> that, was my in, that was my intro really into Lovecraft. Was it? Oh really? Because that came out in a Valentine and, and it was I was in a Tolkien mood at that time. Hmm. So uh, well, so it, well, it worked for me. Well, I would. This is this. This is more of a. He collaborated with R. J. Barlow, and I think Barlow actually probably wrote most of it. But I, I highly, highly recommend the Night Ocean. The Night Ocean. Uh, you guys heard me say it, but a lot of people are are watching that haven't heard me say it. And uh, yeah, definitely read the Night Ocean. I. It's just. It does real well this concept that there's something out there, and. What the hell is it? I don't know what the hell it is, and it also is very uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, very mysterious, moody. You know, it's a very moody, moody piece. Moody, yes. But, but but that story is more you would give an adult. Yeah. Somebody fourteen is going to go. What what did I just read? Yeah, they'd read it and go, nothing happens. This is stupid. You know, you know it's, it's it's just like you know. Henry James's Turn of the Screw isn't exactly the best thing for a 13-year-old to read. Which is very interesting because how old was R.J. Barlow when he wrote The Night Ocean? What, 18? Yeah. Of course, he was extremely... Literate. Mature. <laughs> the, the uh, Rolling... Too much since he committed suicide. There are all these stories you read at different points and you, you reread at different points of your life. Like, I read Turn of the Screw... And I had seen it, of course, adapted on Dark Shadows uh, unofficially. And it was it didn't grip me as, as a great novel, but like when I read it in as an adult, mm -hmm. seeing all the subtleties in it, I'm yeah. going, boy, this is this is fantastic. <laughs> but it can also work the other way. I it's not exactly the same thing, but when I was six, my dad took me to Disneyland. And we went on this ride called Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Yes. It was the most fun I ever had in my whole life. So, like, flash forward, I'm like 21 or something with my college friends. We happen to go to Disney World for spring break, and I see, hey, there's Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Hey, guys, <laughs> we have to go on Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. You've never been on a better ride in your life. And basically, you're going in this slow-moving car, and these cardboard cutouts of characters are popping up. That's like they're going, "What the hell are you talking about?" The same thing happened to me with, uh, you know, as a 
kid visiting down here in Texas, because ironically, this is where all my relatives are, live. And I was born here, then we moved to Iowa when I was six. We come down here for summer vacations, and I have really good memories of that. Um, and we'd always go to this Mexican restaurant called Poncho's, which is basically you go stand in line, and you tell them what you want, and they give it to you, and then you pay. And then when you're at the table, if you're if you're done, and you want, let's say you want more uh, Spanish rice, you raise a flag, and they come ask you what they want, and you, they give you more. And I got these great memories of that. So you know, three years ago we moved down here. First thing I do is take my family to, you know, go to, go to Poncho's. Oh my God, the food's horrible. <laughs> 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 exactly what you're talking about, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there are other things you sometimes see, which are you know, I was saying were over your head. Like I remember uh, a group of friends of mine in the '70s went to see a horror movie called Daughters of Darkness. It's a vampire movie mm. made in Europe. Was it, it had John Carlin from Dark Shadows in it? And it and, and you know they're going in and they they want to see you know, Dracula's risen from the grave or something like that, you know. Traditional vampire movie, you know, a lot of fangs, action. Yeah. And this is a very subtle lesbian vampire movie. <laughs> so I said, you know, I was telling them, at least the girls look great naked, you know. <laughs> Whatever. But when I, I, I you know, I, I saw it maybe like 20 years later and I'm going, what is, what, what a wonderfully sophisticated horror movie. You know, sometimes you have to be the right age coming to a story. I just, to celebrate October, for the first time in my life, I read The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Yeah. And why the hell is that a classic? You know? <laughs> it's like... It, it's yeah. The relevant part that everyone knows about, it comprises maybe... Two pages of text out of like a 40, 30 page story, something like that. And uh, Ichabod Crane is like this doofus. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's no other good word for him. And there's some very derogatory comments about blacks, you know, I guess consonant with the time it was written. Mm -hmm. um, we, we still recommend. <laughs> I mean, You'd have more fun with the Disney version, you know? Yeah. The, the, uh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it looks like I started, looking at the message board here, it looks like I started quite the debate on the, somebody posted the the doom that came to Gotham, and uh, people are going to town discussing this and other stuff on that thread, but somebody said something to the effect, I think it was Sean, said that if Batman, he hasn't read it, but if Batman doesn't die at the end, then it's crap. It's already yeah. crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an alternate world. Yeah, I mean, yeah it's an alternate world. It doesn't world. have to have any kind of continuity with... Yeah. Well, Ed, Matt, Matt and I are pretty picky. It, it is a good story, but what I really want to say is, because, I, you know, Sean, I understand what you're saying about the mythos. You, you can't win, um, and I, I don't disagree with that at all, uh, with, with the concept of what you're saying. If it, it works out a little differently in the Doom that came to Gotham, uh -huh. um, and it works out real well. If I personally was going to write a Batman versus the Mythos, um, where Batman did not die and Cthulhu who, or whoever did not win in the story itself, it would be something along the lines of, you know, Batman temporarily stops it from happening, but the whole Thing has made him realize that one day it's going to happen and he's not going to be able to stop it. And he has to live with that knowledge. And that's the kind of Batman versus the Mythos story um, that I would write, where he realizes that he's not going to win in the end. You know, he might have won that, that temporary battle, but he's not going to win in the end. That's what I would write. So, Well, one thing is just a suspense story. You can't have the Mythos win all the time. Right. You, I mean, you can't beat it hands down. That would be wrong. But, you know, a narrow, pyrrhic victory, which is sort of what happens in the Dunwick horror, if you really look at it. 
that works. What you know, I mean, you know, because you got to have somebody survive once in a while. To tell the story. Well, well and I'm also, not going to give anything away in the Doom that came to Gotham, but some people pay a pretty damn severe price yeah. for that victory, if you remember. Yeah. And, and it's I don't a want victory to in quotes. Them. Pardon me. Victory in quotes. Yes, exactly. I, I I had nothing wrong with its sensibilities. I thought it was a very well crafted story. It's Mike Mignola, right? Yes, it is. He he, he does the Hellboy world. Yeah. And um, so you know he he likes himself some Lovecraft. So. Yeah, as a matter of fact, he wrote a um, Justice League teams up with Dark Side um, story in the late '80s. Mike Mignola did, and it's not exactly Lovecraft, but there is this cosmic horror concept. It's called Cosmic Odyssey, by the way. It's a four-parter, if anybody wants to pick it up. And um, basically, because of dark, dark side screwing around with wanting the uh, ultimate equation formula, or whatever it is, anti-life equation, um, he's unleashed something that makes, he thinks of himself as a god, and basically makes him look like an ant. And so he has to have the Justice League help him, and uh, it's it's got a cosmic horror, horror aspect to it. And yeah, yeah. So Mike Mignola is a big Lovecraft fan. I mean, you know, he was thinking about that when he wrote that story too. So, so yeah, that's how I would write a Batman story. That well, in some ways, that's like Delta Green. You know, where These they win, people... but they know they're not going to win in the long run. You mean? Right. Well, they know that it's it's basically hopeless. They're just trying to like, you know, it's human nature. They're trying to fight the good fight if they can. Right. And uh, they lose agents all the time. Huh. Well, I'm gonna read the uh, what was the name? Uh, that was Dark theaters. Start with that one. You said right. Yeah, it's those really people. quite a good anthology. Okay. Uh. I wanted to go back to one thing we were talking about there before about watching a movie and not being ready for it, you know, yeah. and I mean, I think the first time that I saw Jacob's Ladder, I was not ready for that film, and it was just one of those ones where I had to go back and re-watch it and re-understand it, that it wasn't just a simple horror movie, that there were a lot of philosophical and mythological themes going on there that uh, I could really come away and appreciate it. And, and I like that. I like when a work challenges me that it's that, that you don't get it the first time around. You, you, and then, you know, somebody re-recommends it back to you, and, and yeah, you find out you were wrong, you know. That's, uh, it does happen. Uh, I'm man enough to admit when I'm wrong, but, uh, you, you know, know that, that's... It's been a awfully long time since I've seen that movie. I'm Jake, man enough to admit when you're wrong, too. Oh, excellent, Matt. That's great. But it, what, isn't Jacob's Ladder kind of a, um, you know, what's that movie where the guy is going to be going to be hanged and he thinks he escapes? Oh, a curse at Al Creek. Uh, yeah, isn't it that kind of story? No, no, no. It's he doesn't. Uh, without wanting, I guess it's been out for more than twenty years. It, it's just yeah, it's, he's years. experiencing his death. Right. It's kind of like that movie uh, of pure formality. A uh, French movie. I haven't seen that. Um, it's not as uh, fantastical as Jacob's Ladder, which I agree with Blair. It is a wonderful movie. It's more like this: this guy is waiting in a train station for something or other, and someone comes in and they start having a conversation, and uh, eventually he realizes what's going on with him. Uh, it, well, it's not a horror movie. It's just kind of like striking. Hmm. It might have had... Uh, is it the one that had uh, Roman Polanski in it? Um, I don't know, but it, it kind of reminds me of that play that they had uh, God as a uh, Puerto Rican uh, janitor. <laughs> where, you know... He's got all these people who, who have just died, and they won't—they—they they have to gradually accept that they're dead. 
that's that's what it seems to sound like. That was you know, it was somewhat a somewhat humorous, but ultimately dramatic story. Hmm. Hmm. You know, I wasn't prepared for the sixth sense when I saw it. I had no idea what was going on. I still you think it's a very. You weren't movie. prepared in the sense you didn't like it, or you didn't. No, know. I just I really had no concept of what was going on in the movie until the very end. Of, it just flabbergasted me. I thought it was great. It took me by surprise too, and then a friend of mine basically told me I was an idiot. She said she <laughs> knew he was dead the whole time, and I was like, okay, well, whatever. No, I didn't figure that out either to the end. Yeah. I mean, there are movies where I figure out what, what's going on before they, you know, reveal it, but you know, I didn't in that one, no. And I Some, did, yeah, it was a great movie. Sometimes you can enjoy a movie just because, even if you did that, because you, 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 think, you think you're very clever for catching that. <laughs> it's okay, just like, now, here, okay, this is me being stupid. And anyone, you probably all knew who De Niro was in Angel Heart. I didn't know till the end. Well, I read the book first, and I knew oh. who it was. <laughs> I think I did because they basically said on the back of the VHS. He had crib notes. <laughs> Don't give it away. I think there's enough. I mean, it. it yeah, it, it, you're still trying to figure it all out and interpret. I mean, there's a lot of different ways you can sort of go, but yeah, I mean, it's it's fun even in the telling, though, right? And, and and sometimes you're watching a movie and you're going back and forth. Like you could be watching Angel Heart and thinking, the Nero's got to be this guy. No, he can't be this guy because this just happened. But then, no, no, he has to be that. So you might be, you know, kind of swinging back trying to figure out which way is going to go. Who was who the guy, I forget his name right now, who was the guy that did uh, The Sixth Sense? What's his name? Oh, the, M. Night Shyamalan. Right, so what's the other movie he did where they're all living in the uh, uh, middle of nowhere? The Village? The Village, yeah. I figured that reveal out it, probably exactly 7.3 seconds before they revealed it. I'm like, oh man, is it going to be this? And you know, and it was. But I didn't figure it out through most of the movie. Right, you know, when, when you get near the end, you know, it's becoming, the, you know, the clues are becoming more, so it's yeah, not really a big deal if you figure it out right before the guy get before it's revealed. Yeah, yeah, I take no credit for that. But did you guys like that one? Yeah, uh, I actually do. I'm I'm probably going to get slammed for it, but I do actually enjoy a lot of M Night Shyamalan's works. I mean, I can just I think it's very I don't know. I'm a big fan of you know Dave the Triffids, John Wyndham kind of wacky but interesting science fiction stuff that you don't normally get to see or, or sort of, you know, different kinds of stories. So I like that he's ambitious in what he tries to do. I don't think did it always like works. I liked Unbreakable a great deal. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I liked it. Of course, I'm a superhero nut, so. Right. Yeah, jeez. <laughs> um, you know, there's that factor. But, I, I mean, I yeah. I mean, I thought a couple of shots were unnecessarily slow. But overall, I like the movie. The uh, I recently saw Oblivion, actually, on your recommendation, Mike. Oh, yeah? Uh, what did you think? I, I liked it a lot. Now, Gina and I did figure it out, I think, within the first five or ten minutes, just as sort of kicking it around. Yeah. But we, just, we loved it, though. I mean, it's great science fiction, great story. Um, yeah, so I really appreciated you mentioning that. That was... Uh, well, see, uh, see, I think Tom Cruise does all right in science fiction. Yeah, yeah, I think so too. I think you're right. He was good in that movie. He was horrible in uh, uh, Jack Reacher. He shouldn't be playing Jack Reacher. But didn't you like him in Minority Report? I liked him in Minority yeah. Report, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I thought he would have been a good choice for Mountains of Madness. <laughs> well, you know, everyone that... He's a, he's a nutball. But he's, also, <laughs> he's also a good actor. Um, and, you know, I remember when Interview with a Vampire, when they cast uh -huh. him, you know, Anne Rice was pissed. Everybody on the planet was pissed. 
Um, but look what a good job he did, you know. Well, you know, so long as he doesn't interject his uh, private views into his role, he's fine. Right. Just like, you know, Vanessa Redgrave had some obnoxious political views, but when she was acting, you didn't get that. You just got her as a great actress. Yeah, you remember the, the movie Playing for Time? It's kind of ironic she got that part, but gosh, was she great. Yeah, I'm remembering it's it's about the Holocaust, isn't it? Right. She's Fanya Goldstein. She's an inmate in uh, Auschwitz, I think. And there was a big debate at the time that she for her getting that role. Yes, because she was anti-Zionist. Yeah. Well, I I think you're right about that's a good point about Tom Cruise in science fiction roles. I. I didn't like him in Jack Reacher, which is not sci-fi, of course, because Jack Reacher is a giant. If you read those books, I mean, he's like six foot four or something. Yeah, <laughs> Tom Cruise is not six foot four, so, to say the least. <laughs> His ego is maybe <laughs> on a good day. So, yeah. Well, all the same, Mike. I mean, that was. You know, yeah, I think I, I think that's what I'm going to do for now and in. If it's well, what was he like in War of the Worlds? I mean, I guess that's sort uh, of science that, fictiony sort of. That movie kind of sucked. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I wouldn't blame Cruz for that. The story mm. was just terrible. You know, it was not a good storyline. I actually prefer the 1950s flick better. Oh, I love the 90s 50s flick, and the radio play if you can find an original version of it. You mean the Orson Welles one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty easy to find. It's some. Uh, yeah. But did you? Did you know? Maybe I'm looking at this through Lovecraftian glasses. But in Oblivion, near the end, you know what I'm talking about? Wasn't there a bit of a Lovecraftian element there? Uh, with uh, the the I, enemy, as it were. With with what? The enemy, as it were. The lady. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think Shagath and a few other things. Yeah, I think, yeah. Um, it's hard. I don't want to get too far into it without spoiling the film. Yeah, we can't even really you know, <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's a tough one to, yeah. It, Oblivion, let's leave it at that. Well, Oblivion's a good movie. Yes. Definitely check it out, folks, if you haven't. Yeah. <laughs> In a strange way, Shuggas are probably the most influential thing on horror movies and television that Lovecraft ever created. You Necronomicon? Seen, no? Well, yeah, but I'm thinking like you've seen The Thing, not the Games on Nest version, but the, the yeah. short story, which right. was Who Goes There, yeah. is inspired really by, a, you know, it's a practical usage of a Shuggah to duplicate human beings. Which, let me interject and then go on, Rick, but if uh, anyone likes that movie and that story, I've got an audio drama version of Who Goes There on the Lovecraft Easy and audio page. So, it's uh, it's free. It's good. It's a good listen. And then, you know, we began to get a lot of alien shapeshifters all over the place as a result. Yeah, that's true. So you might say you know, it might be Lovecraft by way of Campbell, but that concept is permeated all over the place. See Robert Louis Stevenson of the idea of the shapeshifter in that sense. Uh, you mean in Jekyll and Hyde? Yeah. And, uh, that was. Uh, I mean, if you can only become one person, and uh, that that story, just to discuss it as a horror story, is, uh, has been sort of mangled by movies. Well, yeah. No, no, I, I know. I mean, just what the co original concept was, it wasn't this goody two shoes who wants to, you know, become even more perfect. It was a guy who was a secret sinner who was probably going out to the red light district to have sex with prostitutes, who figures that, you know, I'm, I'm this prominent doctor and this is going to ruin my career someday unless I can suddenly look totally like another person. Who they'll never suspect, and that's really why he takes the formula. But it unleashes more of his dark side than he wanted. 
Mm -hmm. So it was like, you know, the guy was already messed up to begin with. So he, so he just then becomes totally messed up. That Sean Connery movie did not play it that way at all. <laughs> you mean the Incredible Hulk version? The, uh, yeah, what was the name of that movie? League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, yeah. or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's something that uh, who, better left unsaid. Yeah, well, who, uh, who, who, who wrote the courtyard again? My Alan mind. Moore. Alan Moore. Yeah, Alan Moore should have left alone. Yeah, I just I just read Nemo: Heart of Ice. I didn't really oh. care for it. Yeah, what? I think he's gone overboard with that. That's not Lovecraftian, is it? Well, basically, I think Nemo's daughter is driving the Nautilus, being chased by someone. They go to Antarctica, and they go to the Mountains of Madness. Okay. And so... As you do. <laughs> yeah, so they, they find a Shoggoth, and it's just... Mayhem, mayhem, mayhem. Right, well, the story's barely coherent. Um, I think Alan Moore started reading his own press and starting uh, to believe it. He he has nothing but contempt for the press. No, I mean what people are saying about him. I well, think no one needed to tell him anything. <laughs> That's it, probably true. It, this is what, you know, since, as a person who writes a lot of crossover fiction, this is what can go wrong with crossover fiction. You begin to form a hodgepodge of a lot of things that don't make sense and you're just having them interact with one another. Well, yeah, first and foremost, no matter what it is, it has to be a good story. It also has to be logical how you bring certain people together. Yeah. That's like, uh, I, I've never liked the Holmes versus Dracula because Holmes, if you, if, if you read Adventure of the Sussex Vampire, he doesn't buy in the vampires. So, you know, if you're going to have the supernatural story with Holmes, put it in sort of a semi-science fiction context. A Holmes-Frankenstein crossover could work. A Holmes-Jekyll and Hyde crossover could work. The mythos, if you do it right, more like Shadow of the Time rather than Dreams in the Witch House. Did you read that Shadows over Baker Street anthology? Yeah, and I, and I, and I like the stories that were more science fiction. Yeah. Rather than the ones that were, oh, let me pull out my Necronomicon and talk to Thomas Carnacki about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Gosh, it's, it's, guys, it's 12.30 here. I think I got a crash. Yeah, me too. Uh, great conversation, you guys, and really appreciate everybody watching and the conversation on the message board, too. So. Looking forward to your Halloween chat, Mike. Thanks. Uh, again, we'll chat tomorrow at 6 o'clock Eastern. Everybody watching, if you want to watch then. And then Scott Thomas and I, October the 30th, which I believe is Wednesday, at 10 o'clock Eastern. So, Can I ask one quick question before we go? Um, a study in Emerald. Feelings on that? Brilliant. Sherlock Holmes Cthulhu? Beautiful. You know, I, okay. I, I, I can accept that. That was very well done. Okay, really that good. Was... My feeling is it's a really good story. And it's just reprinted all over the place. I mean, there's some other good Sherlock Holmes mythos stories, too. They but actually, there's a Kickstarter campaign that made it into a game. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that recently. But yes, it's a brilliant story. Okay, I just wanted to get that on the record before we... Yeah, I, I just... I, I, it makes me wish Neil Gaiman wrote more mythos. That's yeah. what, why I was going with that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, cool. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, guys. Talk to you in the week. Everybody watching. We'll uh, see you guys tomorrow. Good night. Good night.